Sorry. I'm so excited today to introduce to you Eric Schultz, a fellow former Daytonian. Throughout our lives, Eric's and I, our paths have crossed. Um, I taught under his mother. His mother was Wilma Schultz. I taught under her when I was teaching kindergarten. He went to school with one of my siblings, and at one point in time, we thought, found out we dated siblings and didn't even know it. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so today we'd like to welcome Eric, and he's going to talk about King Philip's War, a little history, a little genealogy. We'll draw from his book, um, King Philip's War, the History and Legacy of America's Forgotten Conflict, um, which he co-authored with Michael Tugius. As you know, Eric was raised in Dighton. He graduated in 1975 from Dighton Rehoboth. He is now the director, um, one of the directors of the Old Colony Historical uh, Museum. And he is a former chairperson of the New England Historic Genealogical Society American Ancestors. So please give a warm welcome to Eric. But I grew up in Dighton, I grew up in North Dighton, and both of my parents are from Taunton. And uh, my mom's family in particular has very deep roots here, so this feels like, always feels like home to me when I visit. The title of this uh, presentation should really be A Little Genealogy of a Lot of War, because we'll spend most of our time on the war. But it's so rare now that I get into a room full of genealogists that I wanted to share with you just a few minutes of my uh, personal uh, journey around family history. And let me start by asking you a question, okay? Uh, if you think of your four grandparents, of your four grandparents, who, who here was closest to their maternal grandmother, their mom's mom? I would say that's a quarter, maybe a third. So Sonia Solari is a sociologist at the University of Utah. She teaches a course in family studies. And she starts every semester with that question, and she says, without fail, the vast majority of hands shoot up when she asks about the maternal grandmother. It's such a common phenomenon, in fact, that they call it the matrilineal advantage. There's several reasons for that. This meme came through my Instagram the other day. You may be able to relate to this. When our married daughter calls on the phone, I say, hello, Emily, I love you, here's mom. And that's the start of my conversation. But um, the relationship between my mother and her mother was very strong, and that was the strongest for me in terms of my four grandparents. And if it hadn't been for that, I might never have discovered genealogy. I still remember it. It was a spring day, 1975, uh, senior year at DR. Uh, we were visiting my grandmother at 104 High Street. It's right across from Kohanic School and, and St. Thomas Church. My grandparents lived there for about 50 years. And for some unknown reason, my mother and I were up in the attic. <laughs> I'd never been in the attic before, and we stumbled upon a box full of pictures. And we brought them downstairs, and we began identifying them. And I was mesmerized by all these people who had names I recognized but were gone long before I was born. And I, I think that's the day I became interested in family history. Barbara Tuckman has a great line. She says, history isn't taught, it's caught. And that was the day it caught me. Yeah. <clears throat> A few years later, uh, my grandmother Baker presented me with a spiral-bound notebook with the inscription, The Family, I Don't Want You All to Forget Where You Came From. And it had a series of essays that she had written in the late 1960s about our family, everything she could remember or was told. And I think my grandmother was just waiting for the person in the next or the following generation to give this to. We could do a whole maybe seminar on that alone, right? Finding the next person. Um, but for me, if finding those pictures, that box of pictures in 1975 was uh, my start, then getting that notebook and realizing that someone took the time to write about our family was my inspiration. Skip ahead 50 years, I've got a database that has uh, 7,300 names in it. Uh, that may be tiny compared to yours, but it's as big as I can make it and still give it to my children and grandchildren and have them make some sense of it. And I promise I will not bore you with a recitation of these ancestors, except for two. It turns out that Francis Dighton is my ninth great-grandmother. Wow. Right? Through my, uh, my grandmother Baker's Conant and Dean lines. I wish I had figured out this out when both my mother and my grandmother were alive. Francis's husband, you know, know was Richard Williams, who's considered the father of Tom. Um, 
And in the next few minutes, I'm going to load up your book stand with books about King's Principle <coughs> Store. But here's the first one. I highly recommend Bill Hanna's History of Taunton. For more on Richard and Francis Dighton Williams and the founders of Taunton and Dighton and Berkeley and Rainham and Norton and Easton. You might know that Francis' sister, Catherine Dighton, married Massachusetts Governor Thomas Dudley. And that is a very good way to get a town named after your family. <laughs> the other ancestor I'll mention is Captain John Gorham. He's my ninth great-grandfather. He fought in King Philip's War at the Great Swamp Fight. He was shot there. His powder uh, uh, horn was splintered into his body, so he didn't die there. But med medicine being what it was, within a couple of months, he died of infection. So, fortunately for me, he had eight children before that. <laughs> because one of them, Temperance, Temperance Gorman, is my eighth great grandmother. Funny enough, Captain John is also my wife's ninth great grandfather, although wow. through another daughter, the sister of Temperance, Desire Gorman. Wow. So Susan is both my wife and my tenth cousin, which is, <laughs> which is legal in this state. <laughs> this is a case of what you may know, it's called Pedigree Collapse. And so another book to add to your reading list is Adam Rutherford's A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived. He says that the mathematics of genealogy shows that our trees expand until about 1200 AD and then they collapse. So our trees actually look like diamonds with an Adam and Eve sort of up, up at the top. And the reason for this is that they believe about 80% of all human beings have lived within five miles of their birthplace and have married second cousins or closer. Right? First cousins or grandparents, you share grandparents, second cousins you share great grandparents. So that diamond shape and the pedigree collapse, Rutherford says, means that any of us in the United States or in, in uh, Europe with any European roots at all are descended from Charlemagne. So I am proud to say that the king of the Franks, the king of the Lombards, the emperor of the Romans is my 38th time great grandfather. <laughs> and yours too, I think, right? And, and the old nugget we used to use at NEHGS was, it's more important that your ancestors be proud of you than you be proud of your ancestors. Right? <laughs> As part of my genealogical journey, I was fortunate, uh, we mentioned, to, to uh, chair the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And that experience, I don't think it made me necessarily a better genealogist, but it taught me that by bringing together the deceased in family trees has a way of bringing together the living in community. So let me just give you one example and then we'll get on to the war. In 2006, Carrier Corporation purchased the company I was with, Sensitive, and asked if I would be interested in writing their corporate history, which turned into a book called Weathermakers to the World. And as part of my research, just for fun, I did a quick and dirty genealogy of Willis Carrier. He'd been born in Buffalo in 1876, considered the father of air conditioning. Now at the time, Carrier was owned by United Technologies, and they owned Pratt & Whitney and Sikorsky, and Otis Elevators, and they were looking to uh, reform the company around an aviation group and then a business services group. So they were going to bring these two proud companies, Carrier Air Conditioning and Otis Elevator, together in one company, and there was a lot of pushback. Well, as part of my research, I had stumbled upon the fact that Willis Carrier's great-great-grandmother was named Lydia Otis. I didn't put two and two together until one of the VPs at, at United Technology called and said, is it possible that the father of air conditioning, Willis Carrier, and the father of the elevator, o Elijah Otis, are related. Again, I'm not a bad genealogist, but I wasn't going to take this one on. So I gave it to NEHDS, and it turns out that Willis and Elijah were fourth cousins, three times removed. So United Technologies put together this really cool video demonstrating this relationship, which, presented, which they presented to the management teams at Carrier and Otis as a way of helping bring the cultures together. The message was we were already related. <laughs> okay, that's just a little of my own genealogical journey I wanted to show you. Now let's use a little more genealogy to get into the war. The older woman in the center of this picture on the left is Zerviah Gould, born in 1807. She married Thomas Mitchell in 1824. They had 11 children. Here she is with two of her daughters, Melinda and Carla. Zerviah was educated in the public schools in Abington, and she became the first woman of color to apply to Wheaton College. And she lived much of her life on Betty's Neck in Lakeville. And in 1856, she began a campaign to assert her ancestral rights to four lots of land in Fall River. To make her case to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, she needed to show her direct ancestral connection to Massasoit, who was, of course, the Wampanoag who greeted the Pilgrims. So she partnered with local historian Ebenezer Pierce, 
who in 1878 published Indian History, Biography, and Genealogy. It's a monograph that has a history of King Philip's War, along with a biography and genealogy of Massasoit. You can find it. It's free online. You may know a little bit about the author, Brigadier General Ebenezer Weaver Pierce, born in a sonnet in 1822. He joined the 29th in Massachusetts Infantry, and on June 30th, 1862, lost his right arm to a cannonball at the Battle of White Oak Swamp. That was the Peninsula Campaign. We have his military coat at the Old Colony Museum in Taunton. It tells its own story, as you can see. I, as I, as uh, Pat mentioned, I'm lucky enough to be on the board of the Old Colony, along with Cindy, who is our former president, so she outranks me. So, <laughs> But a little bit later this year, this coat will be one of the featured artifacts in a new and reimagined military room at the museum. So Pierce had a checkered military career. He, besides losing his arm, he was court-martialed for presenting burlesque material to his soldiers. <laughs> After the war, he served as a selectman in Freetown. He divorced his first wife and married a second wife who was 42 years his junior. Whoa. And with that interesting resume, that got him elected to the Old Colony Historical Society. <laughs> and that's when he donated his coat. Bill Hanna did a terrific post for the Old Colony blog describing the burial of Pierce's war horse, Midnight in the Lawton Cemetery at St. Bernard Catholic Church in Sonoma. I've seen this. It's a big, it's a big plot. Yeah. yeah. So I loaded Massasoit's genealogy from Pearson Gould's book into my software to make some sense. So Massasoit, first of all, is a title. It means Grand Sachem. Usamikum was his name. He had four children that we know. But given the estimates of his age, this might have been his second family. His first family perhaps being wiped out by European disease, which we now think took out as much as 90% of the Native American population in the century before the pilgrims landed. Wamsutta, or Alexander, was his oldest son, and he married Ritama, who was the sachem of the Pocasset in modern-day Tiverton and Fall River. Ritama mm -hmm. will drown in the Taunton River at Somerset, trying to escape English soldiers in August of uh, 1676, just before Philip's death. And her head will be stuck on a pike in Taunton. Unfortunately, both sides of the war will use these kinds of tactics as a way to strike fear in their enemies. Lisa Brooks is a professor who teaches English and American Studies at Amherst College. Another book to add to your nightstand is Professor Brooks' Our Beloved Kin, Kin which among other things takes an especially good look at the role that Witamo played in the war, a role that has often been overlooked. Massasoit also had a daughter, Amy, who married Tispaquin, or sometimes it's Tuspaquin, who will fight in the war alongside Philip. Zervaya Gould, that line is descended from Amy. And it's well documented in Pierce's monograph, if you want to look. As I mentioned, Zervaya's family, and therefore Amy's descendants, came to reside at Betty's Neck in Lakeville. And not far away, there is a small, peaceful, beautiful, and important graveyard, the Royal Wampanoag Cemetery. It includes some of Massasoit's descendants through Amy's line. Mm -hmm. And it's ancient. The last burial there was in 1812. Mm -hmm. And a spoiler alert, Zervaya is tenacious and she's courageous. She probably deserves her own biography. She will convince Massachusetts of her claims and she'll win the rights to the land in Fall River. Massasoit's second son is Metacom, or Philip, who will come to be known by the English as King Philip. Metacom married Witamo's sister, Utanek Kanusk, in a kind of double bound relationship. Philip and his wife may have had two daughters, sometimes you'll see that in the online genealogies, but we're sure they had a son, was sold into slavery with his mother in the Caribbean after the war. <coughs> Folks here, if you're from Bridgewater, may know that it was the Reverend James Keith who argued persuasively that Philip's son should not be hung. In other words, despite biblical uh, scripture, the sins of the parents were not the sins of the children. Philip's son was all, if we think, 10 or 11 at the time. There is a story that Philip's son slipped over the side of the ship and escaped to Canada. So there are people who claim descent through Philip's son. It's not unusual for me to receive a letter like this every so often. So if you start right here, I'll just read this one sentence. My great-grandfather was born in Niles, Michigan in 1873, and when he was 95 in 1968, he told my mother we are direct descendants of King Philip, and he didn't want the family to forget it, but to pass it on to future generations. So we don't have a reliable, a written source genealogy of Philip's line, but there is plenty of tradition around what genealogists call the Royal House of Pocahontas. People have claimed direct descent 
of Massasoit through Philip. And this letter is just one example. Okay, so that's the family. Now let's get the war <coughs> the time. The pilgrims land in 1620. The American Revolution begins in 1776. And King Philip's war is fought in southern New England in 1675 and 1676. About a half century before Plymouth is founded <coughs> and a century before the Revolution. The war pitted the English in New England, who were voracious for land and spreading rapidly against the Native Americans who had been there for thousands of years. The war will last about 14 months here in southern New England, from the first attack in June in 1675 in Swansea to the capture of Anawan in August of 1676. And then there will be another two years of fighting in modern-day New Hampshire and, and Maine. We won't cover that today. It's the beginning of a much larger pattern of conflict that's going to determine whether the English, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, or the Native Americans are going to possess North America. So it will be followed by a series of wars, King William's, Queen Anne's, King George's, that historians now sort of roll up into the French and Indian Wars, all of which lead up to the American Revolution. The three Native American tribes that will prosecute the war in southern New England are the Wampanoag, which includes Philip's people, the Poconocket, based around Bristol and Warren, Rhode Island, and Wetamos Pocasset in Fall River and Tiverton. The Narragansett in modern day Rhode Island, the strongest of all the native tribes when the war begins. And the Nipmuc in central Massachusetts. And then later to the north, the Abenaki will get involved. So keep in mind, we're not Massachusetts until 1692. So at the time of King Philip's War, there's a Plymouth colony, what we call today the Old Colony, led by Governor Josiah Winslow. There's Massachusetts, which is led by Governor John Leverett, and then there's Connecticut, led by Governor John Winter Jr. And then there is this ragtag bunch of malcontent, malcontents in what we call Rhode Island today, who also contribute <laughs> to the war effort. Before we get into the events, just a word about the book that Mike and I uh, wrote. The hardcover was published in 1999 by Norton. We did a soft cover in 2000, and then in 2017, Norton published a second edition of the soft cover. That's the one on the right, which is why you see the, the two covers from time to time. Nat Philbrick had asked me to read the section about King Philip in, May, in the Mayflower book, and he returned the favor by writing the foreword for our book. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to recommend a couple of other books about the war, but what makes this book different is that it was written as a travel log. So we tell the history in about 100 pages, and then we try to visit and describe all the sites. And we did the research before Google Maps and GPS. <laughs> we did a lot of driving. I tend to access history through a sense of place, through location, even if it's just a rock. So I used to return from a long day of research and my wife would ask, see any good rocks today? <laughs> but it's that sense of place, the foundation hole, the garrison, the tree, the ambush site, the rock, that we try to describe in the book and make accessible to the people. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Massasoit died of natural causes in 1661 after presiding over 40 years of peace with the English. His oldest son, now you know, Wampsutta, becomes Grand St. John. The following year, in 1662, Wampsutta is forcibly taken from his hunting lodge on Montpossett Ponds in present-day Halifax by Josiah Winslow. He's marched to Duxbury to meet with the governor, Josiah's father, Edward. While Wampsutta is being questioned, he becomes suddenly and violently ill and dies on his return to Warren, Rhode Island. We really aren't sure what happened. There is one doctor, a modern doctor, who says the symptoms resemble appendicitis. But Philip and many of the Poconaca believe that Wampsutta had been poisoned by the English because they concluded he was a threat and an obstacle to their acquisition of the land. Wampsutta's uh, hunting lodge was located near White Island. There is a historical marker at White Island Road in 58 in Halifax commemorating his capture. So with Wapsutta's death, the second son, Philip, is suddenly and unexpectedly the Grand Sage. So the second event leading up to the war occurred not far from where we are. Many of you will recognize this picture of the Taunton Agreement signed at the Meeting House at present-day Church Green, home today of the First Parish Church. I managed to snag a couple of these on eBay so I can pass them around so you can get a little bit better look at the engraving. This so-called agreement forced Philip to give up his guns, which he probably didn't agree, except under extreme threat. 
and the meeting occurs in 1671, so we're nine years after Wapsutta's death and four years before the war begins. By the way, the calendar engraving that you're all looking at was done for New England Mutual Life by one of the most famous illustrators of the 19th century, Frank T. Merrill. He's best known for having illustrated Louisa May Alcott's 1880 edition of Little Women. If you visit the Museum of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company in Faneuil Hall, you can see a painting of the scene of the time. So you would say, in retrospect, the scene made for, a, for beautiful art and a handsome calendar in 1900, but in 1671 it did more to instill distrust than it did agreement or peace. The third event, the one that really triggered the war, was the death of John Sassamon. Sassamon was a Native American, attended Harvard, fought with the English in the Pequot War in 1636 and 7, and converted to Christianity, so-called praying Indian, and served as a translator for both Wampsutta and Philip. He was discovered in January of 1675 under the ice at Assawampsett Pond in Lakeville. First, his death was ruled an accident, probably been ice fishing and fallen in. Then the English heard from a informer, a Native American informer, and came to believe it was murder. You can actually see, maybe you're not, the eyewitness there back by the tree. Plymouth held a trial, very much a kangaroo court. Three of Philip's men were convicted and hanged, probably none of them guilty. So John Sassamon's trial will be the event that will convince Philip if the possible poisoning of his brother and the Taunton Agreement hadn't already, that he will never be able to receive justice from the English. This trial is well documented, it's fascinating. Dr. Kawashima is a historian and legal scholar at the University of Texas. He wrote an excellent book on the events surrounding the trial and the nature of English justice as it applied to the Native Americans. And none of you, I don't think, none of you will remember this firsthand, but some of you will recall the existence of a thing called King Philip Tavern. It was supposed to have been built near the spot of the alleged murder. You can see the United Church of Christ near, uh, near Precinct Bedford and Main Street. It's just about where the tavern sat. King Philip Tavern was converted from a private home to serve the growing uh, trend in automobile traffic, and it burned to the ground in 1919, which is why I don't think <laughs> remember it. So as we begin talking about the war, I just want to give you a word of caution. I'll call this my George Washington slept here warning. There are many sites and artifacts attributed to King Philip. Rocks, caves, trees, lookouts, even chairs. Just be what I'll call appropriately skeptical. There are just a handful of accounts, maybe a dozen in all, that are contemporaneous with the war. And there are four that seem to contribute 90% of most of the material we see. There is a history published by the Reverend Increase Mather, who was cotton trial, minister at Boston. He's intimately involved, you may know, in the Salem witch trials. He's a Puritan minister through and through, and he believes the English were placed by God in the New World to possess the land. That is the interpretation you would get in the book. But at the time of the war, there was only one printer in the colonies, and that was in Cambridge. And Mather knows there's at least one other history being written. So he rushes his draft to the printer and I think in the process makes a mistake and loses some context and, and some facts. His competitor was the Reverend William Hubbard, the minister at Ipswich. Hubbard's history is more detailed. It also takes the war into Maine after it ends here. One edition of Hubbard and one edition of, of uh, Mather is edited by Samuel Drake, who was one of the founders of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And Drake adds lots of footnotes with genealogical info in, in them if you're looking to tie an ancestor to <coughs> Hubbard had the advantage of being neighbors with Samuel Appleton, who led English troops in the Connecticut River va Valley and led mass troops at the Great Swamp Fight, and was considered the most capable colonial commander of the world. So Hubbard had a great source, a neighbor, for first-hand accounts and information. <coughs> Samuel was also the original proprietor of Appleton Farms in Ipswich, if you've ever been. It was operated by <coughs> nine generations of the Appleton family, before it was deeded to the trustees of the reservation in 1998. Still a beautiful spot to visit. And then there's the entertaining history of Benjamin Church of Little Compton, America's original Natty Bumpo or Daniel Boone, who leads the soldiers that will kill Philip in modern day Bristol, Rhode Island. And of course, Church also writes about his dramatic descent down the face of Anawan Rock to capture Anawan and end the war. Church doesn't have the same Puritan perspective as Hubbard or Matt. In fact, he had good relations with the, with the Sakonet in Little Compton and their sachem of Washington. And he believed the English and the Native Americans could and should live together in peace. 
The issue with Church's history is that he's the star. So if he was at the event, it's essential to the outcome of the war, and if he wasn't there, he might leave it out of the book entirely. And we also have the captivity narrative of Mary Rollins, the minister's wife who was kidnapped uh, during the attack on Lancaster and held for 11 weeks by Native Americans. Her book became a bestseller in the colonies. None of these books are what you would consider modern, carefully sourced histories, but they are contemporaneous with the war. They were written by people who lived through it and fought it. Uh, in one of Church's battles, for example, in one of his descriptions, what we call today the Peacefield Fight, which took place in Tiverton, he refers to black rocks, which, we, which still exist and allowed us to actually place the battle. So if Mather, Hubbard, Church, and Rowlandson mention a rock or a cave or a garrison, I take it as the most reliable source that we have. Conversely, if you visit a cave in Norton where King Philip hid, or a cave in Simsbury, Connecticut, where he watched the town burn, or a lookout on Sugarbush Mountain where he planned his attack in Deerfield, or maybe a chair he sat on that was miraculously spared in a fire in a garrison, or even the famous Metacom's War Club at Fruitlands Museum. Just be appropriately skeptical. Try to find a source for the story or artifact that is contemporaneous, not something that was, say, given as a speech in the centennial celebration in the town. <laughs> Being mentioned in a secondary source doesn't make it wrong, because oral tradition has some power to it. But as President Reagan used to say, trust but verify, right? And let me give you just one example. Many of you will recognize King Philip's Oak, it grew on Somerset Avenue and White Street in Taunton. In 1926, the Daughters of the American Revolution placed a plaque on the tree commemorating as a spot where Philip and his people would meet. And then in 1973, it started dropping limbs. So a decade later, Taunton's Park Department was forced reluctantly to take it down. People were very upset. This was a direct living link to King Philip. But when they counted the rings on this beautiful old tree, they found that it had been planted about a century after Philip's death. <laughs> a while back on the Dighton Facebook page, which I really like, I saw where someone asked what King Philip looked like. It's a good question, but the answer is we don't know. There was no contemporaneous image made of him. There are lots and lots of images out there of Philip. The one in the middle is owned by the Hafen Rifle Museum, and they were kind enough to allow Mike and I to use it on the cover of our first edition. Some of the images of Philip are, are striking. They're, they're, they're beautiful. The painting in the middle was done by Thomas Hart Benton in 1922. In 20th century marketing, images of Philip were used to sell beer and chewing gum and coffee and tobacco and pickles and even Kellogg's cereal. And as you can see on the Sour Pickles label in the Frosted Flakes box, illustrators of the 20th century were doing what Frank Merrill did in his 1900 calendar, relying on, I don't know, Geronimo or Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse or some other 19th century model for their image of a 17th century sage. It would be like using Ulysses S. Grant as a model for Miles Standish. The most famous of Philip's images was done by Paul Revere in 1772. In fact, you can find this image on the inside back cover of the 250th uh, anniversary booklet for Dighton. It's not a very flattering image, and historians wondered for a long time where Revere got his model. About 200 years after, a historian by the name of Brad Swan was visiting the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester and spotted hanging on the wall a mezzotint called the Four Kings of Canada. And it was a display of four Mohawk chiefs done in 1710. Here are two of them. So what Revere did is what we today would call a mashup. He barred and mixed elements from each. And he put the famous Wampanoag belt, which Anawan gave to church at Anawan Rock, around Philip's waist in this picture. Since the Mohawk and the Wampanoag had a long-standing war called the Mohawk War, I think Philip would be mortified to know that his most famous image was based on his deadly enemies. <laughs> the war begins in Swansea in June 1675. On June 19th, the home of Joe Winslow, is vandalized by Poconocket warriors. You remember when the volcano with the unpronounceable name erupted in Iceland? It canceled all the flights in Europe. Mm -hmm. And how about the BP oil spill on the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon? And there was something called Snowmageddon, 40 inches of snow that we all faced. Mm -hmm. Okay, those all happened in 2010. It was 13 years ago. 13 years from 1675 to 1662. 
That was the year Wampsetta was captured by Josiah Winslow and marched to Duxbury to meet with Josiah's father, Governor Edward Winslow. That was the year that the Poconocket believed that Wampsetta was poisoned when he was confined by and in the care of the Winslows. Turns out Governor Edward is Joe Winslow's grandfather, and his uncle is the current governor, Governor Josiah Winslow. So it's no wonder, thinking memory as fresh as it may have been, that the Poconocket choose a Winslow home as the first home that they terrorized. Mm -hmm. By the way, when Governor Josiah hears this, he moves, his family's in Marshfield, he moves them away and secrets them in some location because he's afraid his home will be attacked next. Things kind of spiral out of control very quickly after this. On June 20th, the band Poconocket loot and, and set fire to several homes at Kickamuit. And we've tried very hard in the book to find the exact locations of these things, so the description's in there, if we can. On June 21st and 22nd, Governor Winslow orders 200 troops to assemble. Most of them are from this area, Bridgewater and Tom. And then on June 23rd, I suppose I would say that's the day the war begins. The Poconocket are looting, and a youth of about 20 by the name of John Salisbury shoots and wounds one of the Poconocket. So if you agree with me that it's June 23rd is the start of the war, then in six days, we will mark the 348th anniversary of King Philip's War. If you want to write a book for the 350th, you got to start now. <laughs> Two years is a short time to write a book. And then on June 24th, probably in retaliation, Salisbury and eight others were killed. Just a, just a note here for me. It seems clear to me, as you read the description, that the war was not a carefully orchestrated plan on either side. Sort of like Archduke Ferdinand being assassinated in in Sarajevo in 1914. It's likely that the attacks on Swansea were spontaneous, probably not blessed by Philip. Nobody would start a war after the planting and before the harvest unless they wanted to start. Mm -hmm. And on the English side, when Governor Winslow gets a hold of Governor Leverett and says, hey, help, Governor Leverett says, not my problem. It's your colony, you handle it. Right? So there's not this coordinated view of thing going on on either side of this mm -hmm. Very quickly, the old Miles Garrison in Swansea becomes the center of action. We do a fair, fair uh, bit in the book on it. Unfortunately, the garrison is now gone. You can visit the spot. There is a marker shown on the right at the intersection of Old Providence and Barneyville Roads. In our book, we transcribe that marker. You can see by the names that both John Salisbury and his father, William, were killed in the opening days of the war. Now, now we're into it, okay? English troops try to trap Philip on the Mount Hope Peninsula, but he's way too fast, too smart. The Native Americans know the land much better than the English do. And the English are too tentative. Some of the colonial soldiers fought in the Pequot War. Some fought with Cromwell in, in England, but most of them are farmers. And for the most part, they have matchlocks, not flintlocks. They have an older technology. You know, a matchlock, if it's wet in the morning, won't fire. Right? It, it's, just, it's just too wet. This is a map from the book, by the way. We tried very hard to map as much as we could to sort of capture the sense of place. There's at least one theory that the Native Americans were better equipped for muskets than the English and used the flintlocks more frequently in hunting. And the Dutch and the French were more than happy to sell guns to the Native Americans. It was illegal, but the English were also happy to sell them guns as well. So at the start of the war, it's possible that the Natives are more skilled with a better technology than the English are. And the fighting kind of bears that out. There's a great book by Patrick Malone. Dr. Malone's a retired professor at Brown. He wrote an excellent treatise on how warfare might have unfolded in colonial America, and specifically in King Philip's War. Taunton was also attacked in June 1675. Several townsmen were killed, but the most famous, of course, was Edward Bobbitt, or Babbitt, who was living in modern-day Berkeley. At the first sign of trouble in Swansea, he had been able to re relocate his family to the safety of the garrisons closer to the Taunton Green. However, the story goes, he and his dog returned to their home in modern Berkeley to get something. They say a cheese press, but that doesn't seem possible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they're spotted by a Native American. Edward climbs a tree out of sight, but his dog barks, gives him away, and Bob is killed. His neighbors placed a crude gravestone near the spot which is now in the collections of the Old Colony History Museum. As you can see, Director Katie McDonald and Curator Bronson Michaud have done a terrific job kind of reimagining the museum. 
including creating an exhibit dedicated to King Philip's War, which includes the Bobbitt Stone, the Thompson Long Gun from Middlebar, which we'll talk about in just a second, and other related artifacts. So it's a great place to start learning about the war. If you drive along Berkeley Street today, you cannot miss, although I have missed it, so you can miss, but you shouldn't miss the marker, <laughs> which shows the original spot of the Bobbitt Stone. Uh, the original stone, by the way, was later used to build a stone wall, so the family had to rescue it. Uh, in July of 1675, this is the following month now, Middleborough was attacked. The townspeople gathered for, for protection at the Old Fort, which is near the former Memorial High School. About a half mile away, a small group of natives have gathered near a rock at what is today Barden Hill. And they were apparently hurling insults and threats at the English in the fort. And so Thompson gave his long gun to Isaac Howland, who was known for being a marksman. And his job was just to fire in their general direction as a warning that the English were armed and they weren't afraid. Well, instead of warning them, at least this is the way the story goes, he happens to hit and kill them, was standing on the rock. And as the man falls, his hand touches the rock and makes a perfect impression. That spot today is called Hand Rock. It is a perfect impression. I've seen it. Uh, I was able to visit it when I researched the book in the early 1990s, but today it's on, I tried again, it's on private property and you need to make a call. So, as a general warning, some of these things are on private property, so we just need to be respectful. The story of Hand Rock is obviously a legend. Gunner, gunner experts have shown that long guns like the Thompson model fire something like 150 or 200 yards, well under the half mile they have to fire like that. To hit, to hit the man. If you have an interest in petroglyphs, though, which are not fables or myths at all, they are beautiful rock carvings, usually done with a chisel by Native American craftsmen. And there are several carvings in the middle barrel, along with hand rock. Someone did four or five carvings in the area. There are also some on Betty's Neck in Lakeville and in North Kingston in Rhode Island. We don't know if hand petroglyphs were religious, if they were art, if they were perhaps practical, maybe marking a boundary, but they are beautifully done. And there are several good studies online that will tell you how to find hand petroglyphs nearby. So the answer to your question, seen any good rocks today, is, well, <laughs> yes, I have seen some good rocks. Also in July 1675, Menden is attacked, which is a big deal because it's the first town in Mass Bay that's attacked. And Governor Leverett in Boston can't keep telling Governor Winslow that it's your problem. The Nipmuc lead this attack, so they are now in war, at war alongside the Wampanoag. And they have some very able commanders, two in particular, uh, Mutwell and Matunus. And in August, the Nipmuc attacked Brookfield, the old uh, Quabog plantation. The siege is made famous by clergy historians in their books because the natives try to light a cart on fire and push it into the garrison to smoke the colonists out, but rain miraculously falls and puts the fire out. Everything's in motion at this point, and some of the action moves out to the Connecticut River. I won't try to cover it all. There's a lot that goes on out there. But in the fall of 1675, there are two events worth mentioning. In September, Captain Richard Beers of Watertown and 36 mounted men lead an ox team that is abandoning Squawkeep Plantation, which is modern Northfield, they, and that had been attacked and burned. Beers and his men are ambushed at present-day Northfield. 21 are killed, and Beers' ambush becomes a very, very dark day for them. And that's followed by the ambush at Bloody Brook in modern-day South Deerfield. Captain Thomas Lathrop from Beverly and 79 soldiers, mostly from Essex County, are sent to evacuate Deerfield. The soldiers and Teamsters stop to rest, and they are ambushed. Mutwump and the Nipmuc will kill 40 soldiers and 17 Teamsters. It is a devastating event for the English. And there's a sense at this point in the war that the Native Americans might very well push 50 years of colonial settlement back to the beaches of the Atlantic. There's a marker showing the soldier's mass grave. The grave was discovered, of course, many years after the event, but this marker is considered the oldest surviving monument to veterans in the United States. And in 1838, the site was commemorated with this inscribed memorial. Edward Everett was the keynote speaker. He'd been the governor of Massachusetts. He would be uh, appointed secretary of state. And except for Daniel Webster, he was probably the greatest orator of his day. To give you some sense of how important Bloody Brook and King Philip's War still were in the 19th century. Everett would also speak at the dedication of the Lexington Concord battlefields at Bunker Hill to help raise money to save Mount Vernon from destruction. And then one day he would deliver 
13,000 words at a place called Gettysburg just before Lincoln delivered 207. Mm -hmm. The first year of war closed with a single bloody state of the war. The Great Swamp Fight occurred on a snowy day in December of 1675. An, an army of about 1,100 men that included Plymouth, Mass Bay, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and about 150 friendly Mo Mohegan warriors attacked a palisaded Narragansett village of men, women, and children in the Great Swamp in South Kingston, Rhode Island. The story, as it's told by the Puritan historians, was that the fort was unfinished and the English entered it by a fallen tree at an exposed opening. It seems more obvious when I read the accounts that this entrance was intentionally created by Kanacha, the brilliant Narragansett commander, to ensure that a larger and stronger force would have to attack single fire. And that's what happened. The English breach the fort, but are thrown back. They attack again, but are thrown back. And they finally enter in force. And I'm going to assume that my ninth great-grandfather is in one of these illustrations. <laughs> Once the fighting moves within the fort, the English set it on fire. Everything's destroyed. Shelter, food, supplies. As many as 400 women and children are killed. The Narragans, who have not even entered the war, consider this attack unprovoked and a massacre of innocents. The depiction of the Great Swamp fight on the right also hangs in Faneuil Hall at the Museum of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Society, right near the painting of Phillips Tottenham. The site of the Great Swamp fight is marked today by an obelisk. There is a long-standing debate about whether we have found the correct location of the battle. There have been artifacts found at this site, and there's a sketch done by Ezra Stiles, famous here in Dighton, when he visited the site in 1782. But when archaeologists have dug test pits in the area, they tend to be sterile, which means they don't contain anything like the kind of rich remains you would expect to find in a palisaded village of maybe a thousand people. There are archaeologists and there are Narragansetts who say they know the correct spot, but we won't reveal it as they consider it separate. When I was researching the book years ago, before drones and GPS, I hired a plane and we flew over the swamp, and you can see a change in the color and species of the tree, which indicates the trees, which indicates about five acres of upland or drier, sandier soil surrounded by swamp. I understand there are a number of areas of upland in the swamp, and it stands to reason that if this isn't the spot, the Narragansett Fort would have been built on one of those pieces of upland. It's a great place for history. If you're a birder, it's a great place. It's also a great place to get ticks. <laughs> so be very careful. Many years ago, my wife and I were able to purchase artifacts found at the traditional location of the Great Swamp Fight by the family that farmed the area. They used to charge 25 cents. Take the train in, you, you pay 25 cents, they'd give you a shovel and you could dig anywhere you wanted. Right? We donated these, donated these artifacts to the NEHGS, where they are still there and you can visit them. Also in that first winter, we're now we're into February of 1676, Lancaster was attacked and the minister's wife, Mary Rowlandson, was captured. Mary would travel with the natives for 11 weeks. During that time, she would meet Philip, and she would meet Rutama, and she will be among the first to understand, despite a series of impressive military victories, that the Native Americans are growing desperate and they are growing hungry, winning on the battlefield, but they're really losing the war of attrition. The site of the Rollinson Garrison used to be marked by this pine tree. Here it is in 1906. It was still hanging on when I visited in the early 1990s. It was on the grounds of Atlantic Union College. The college closed in 2018. The pine tree is now gone. If you want to visit the spot where Mary was released by the natives or redeemed, you can hike the Mid-State Trail on Wachusett Mountain near Westminster and visit Redemption Rock. Springtime brings the Sudbury fight. It's another devastating loss for the English, but what we now know was probably the dying gasp for the native culture. Captain Samuel Wadsworth and Samuel Brocklebank march their troops into town. They are ambushed, they regather, they fight their way up Green Hill and Sudbury. After about four hours of fighting, they reach the top of the hill, very little loss, a defensible position, and this time, the natives set things on fire. And the hillside is ablaze and there's chaos. Wadsworth, Brocklebank, and 27 of their men are killed. The English soldiers are buried in a mass grave in what is today the Wadsworth Cemetery in Sudbury. Captain Wadsworth's grandson, Benjamin, is six years old when his grandfather is killed. In 1725, Benjamin will become the eighth president of Harvard. The sites in Sudbury are nicely marked, though I understand there is a movement to rewrite the text in a more balanced way. So a quick recap. 
Okay, dozens of English towns are attacked and burned. Colonial troops keep walking into these devastating ambushes. Major Appleton actually has some success in the Connecticut River Valley and secures some of the towns, but only after Beer's ambush in Bladebrook, two of the worst days of the war for the settlement. The English actually count the Great Swamp Fight as a win, but it's highly questionable. They suffer 70 dead, 150 wounded, and they manage to bring the powerful Narragansett into the war on the side of the Wampanoag and the Nittany. Spring 1676 rolls around and the natives continue to win major battles at places like Sudbury. On the surface, it looks very bad for the English. But in truth, the natives are losing the underlying war. As I mentioned, harvest was impossible in 1675, planting was impossible in 1676. They can't even spend any time in their traditional fishing sites. There's hunger everywhere, and in some places there's starvation. They have talented blacksmiths, the natives do, who uh, can repair their guns, but they have no way of making gunpowder. In fact, the English don't until they finally get a plant in Milton toward the end of the war. And the Native Americans are running out of warriors. If the two sides fight and each lose 10, it's a loss to the Native Americans. There's just not as many people. And when Kanacha is captured in the spring of 1676, they are also running out of military leaders. The death blow comes in August of 1676 when Philip is shot and killed at Mount Hope in Bristol, Rhode Island, by a band of soldiers under Benjamin Church. Ironically, it is a Native American by the name of Alderman who kills Philip. Many years later, this, spot, uh, this location will become the estate of James DeWolf, who will invest in a manufacturing mill in North Titan. When that company closes, a gentleman by the name of J.K. Milligan will form a bleacher there. One of Philip's hands had been scarred by some kind of an accident with a musket, but the scar makes his hand identifiable. So as a reward, Church cuts it off and gives it to Alderman, who will preserve it in a bucket of rum and make his living by exhibiting, exhibiting the hand. <laughs> and Philip's head will be sent to, to uh, Plymouth and exhibited on a pike for what we think was maybe 25 years. The spot of Philip's death in Bristol is marked. Again, be careful about private property. There's also a rock formation nearby called the Seat of Medicom, but I invite you to try to sit in it. <laughs> Not long after Philip's death, Church and his men capture Annawood in modern-day Rehoboth. You know the spot right off Route 44, which of course didn't exist then. It's a heroic scene in Church's book, but it's also worth remembering that Annawood is elderly. He was Massasoit's war chief and contemporary. So 80-something, 70-something is leading mostly women and children who are outgunned, hungry, and perhaps starving. And so, yes, Church is a hero. He's brave. But be a little skeptical of the details. Remember our friend uh, Ebenezer Pierce, when he does the research for Zerviah Gould Mitchell's book, he visits Anna Wanrock, and this is what he writes. I'm 19 years older than Captain Church was when he performed this feat that has been wondered at and applauded for more than 200 years. And in that 19 years, I have grown, as Church would express it, ancient and heavy, as well as clumsy. He had two strong arms and two very active hands, while I have but one arm and one hand, and not an awkward left. And yet I passed down the rock and passed up again without the aid, etc., etc. In fact, experienced less difficulty in doing so than in getting over many an ordinary stone wall. We don't have many written accounts from the Native American perspective. So it's kind of nice once in a while to get a little balance in the texts. We think that as, as Benjamin Church grew older, he visited Animal to show the scene to his family members. And it's, of course, it's still a fun and interesting place to visit today. So we've traced a war that began in Swansea and escalated in Plymouth Colony with attacks in Taunton and Middleborough, erupted in Mass Menden when the Nipmuc joined the Wampanoag, shifted to the exposed settlements along the Connecticut River Valley at Beers Ambush and Bloody Brook, and then had its largest and bloodiest uh, day of the war in South Kingston, Rhode Island, at the Great Swamp, when the Narragansett are forced into the war. But then it all ends pretty quickly and dramatically, uh, frankly not far from where we're sitting despite what appear to be continued native victories. You can see from this map, which is in the book, there are lots of events we haven't covered today. From the Pocasset Swamp fight, to the attack on Bridgewater, to the Battle of Turner's Falls, to something called Pierce's Fight in Central Falls. They're all covered in the book. Losses from King Philip's War on both sides were staggered. 17 New England settlements were destroyed, 50 were damaged. The English experienced 800 deaths, or about 1,500 deaths per 100,000 people while the natives experienced death at about 10 times that rate. 
You can see from the chart why King Philip's War is sometimes referred to as the bloodiest war per capita in American history. The combined losses ended forever a way of life of two peoples peacefully living side by side for 50 years in southern New England. Some Native Americans escape. They'll flee to New York. They'll flee to Canada. Some are executed. Some become servants. They had proved that they hadn't been involved in the war. And many are sold into slavery in the West Indies. Unfortunately, there's an economic component to this war. The colonies are broken. They have to pay for the war. Two communities, Gay Head of Martha's Vineyard and Mashpee on Cape Cod, were relatively untouched by the war. And Native Americans there will be able to catch many of their traditions. In the end, however, King Philip IV will become a template for the forceful removal of Native Americans from the land. King Charles and British administrators are appalled that these low-level colonial bureaucrats, all of our heroic ancestors, cannot keep the Native population in check and almost lose the King's new world holdings. So shortly after the war, the Crown will begin tightening governance around a part of the world it had almost ignored for 50 years. Among other actions, for example, it forces together Mass Bay and Plymouth into Massachusetts. But from the colonists' perspective, they have just fought and won a war with zero support from the mother country. And they were pretty happy about governing themselves for the last 50 years. Things were going okay. And they will resist this tightening for the next century. And you can see the seeds of the American Revolution being planted in the wake of King Philip's War. One final postscript, and that's about our shoddy treatment of veterans. Another template established by King Philip's War. So as Massachusetts soldiers were mustering on Dedham Plain, which is now the Hyde Park section of Boston, before the Great Swamp Fight, the governor sends a message that says, if they take the Narragansett Fort, they will also be given a gratuity of land along with their wages. That's December 1675. Well, they took the fort. <coughs> Unfortunately, it would take Massachusetts 59 years until 1734 before veterans and their heirs received the land promised them in 1675. And I say heirs because there were only a handful of veterans from, from the Great Swamp Fight still alive in 1732. There were seven Narragansett townships established, towns that would be settled by the heirs of the soldiers of the Great Swamp Fight. Genealogically speaking, number four may be of great interest since it covers many of the families whose veteran fathers and veteran grandfathers came from Worcester County. This information is all captured in an 1892 book by George Madison Bodge, a minister and historian. Bodge had access to John Hull's account books, and Hull was the treasurer of Mass Bay during the war. So if you got paid, it's pretty much a guarantee that you also fought. Bodge lists the names of the men who fought at the Great Swamp Fight from Dighton, Taunton, Bridgewater, Rehoboth, and a number of local towns. And I know, you know you can't read that, so I blew up just one example. This is Bridgewater. The veterans left it, uh, listed on the left side and the grantee on the right. Oldest sons came first, but then oldest daughters came second. So as you can see, in the case of Richard Burnham, his daughter Abigail Hubbard gets the land. Unfortunately, you may notice, you cannot visit the town or library of Narragansett number 4 because Greenwich, Massachusetts no longer exists and hasn't since it was disincorporated, dismantled, and flooded in 1938 as part of the Quadrant Reservoir. And I mention this fact because as we wrap it up, it gives me the opportunity to plug my King Philip's War co-author, Mike Togas. After co-authoring the book with me, Mike has gone on to write some 30 books, including a great one about the quality. He is a one-man marketing machine, a terrific speaker. If you haven't seen Mike speak, <clears throat> you haven't seen Mike speak. <laughs> one of the really good people that I met because of King Philip's War. If you don't already have enough to read, there are three other possibilities to add to your night's nice day, okay? Still, the single best study of the war, in my mind, is Douglas Leach's Fort Mock published in 1958. Dr. Leach was a professor emeritus at Vanderbilt, but he attended Brown, where I went. So I used that slim connection to ask him to review our first draft, which he graciously agreed to do. He was nearly 80 at the time, suffering from leukemia, but he still took the time to mark up our draft and write a blurb for the dust jacket. And I would also mention here, not a punishment, who ran the Wampanoag site at Plymouth and was one of the best historians of the colonial Wampanoag world. He tragically died in his early 40s. He was also incredibly gracious and kind when I was doing my research. And there are other people who since passed on who many of you will know. Helen Pearson Swanson, Rick Hosmer, Hosmer in Lancaster, Russell Gardner, the Wampanoag tribal historian, Ella Seketa, the Narragansett tribal historian. All were willing and, willing and happy to help. 
you know, I was thinking it's, it's the, the David McCulloughs and the Stephen Ambroses and the Ken Burns and the Barbara Tuckmans of history that get all the press. Right? And they are deserving. But it's the existence of local historians like, like Pat here and, and Pat Menges did so much to help me with well, our research and Bill Hannon and Katie McDonald just down the road. They are to me kind of the unsung heroes and crown jewels of the history world. There's another good history of King Philip were written by two Connecticut River Valley historians, George Ellis and John Morris. That came out in 1906. Not only is it well-researched and very readable, but it's full of black and white pictures of the sites of King Philip's War, the way they looked a century ago. And finally, Jill Lepore's professor at Harvard, who booked the name of War, won the Bancroft Prize in 1998. So Professor Lepore's interest was not so much in a chronological retelling of the events of the war, but in understanding how the colonists represented those events and used language to define the war. So it's very much worth reading, but it's probably not your first book. If you're new to King Philip's War you're look and are looking for a straightforward retelling, you want to start with Leach, or maybe better yet, Schultz and Tobes. <laughs> so again, I want to thank Gail and the chapter for having me here today, and all of you for taking the time on a Saturday to come out. I sat down with Katie McDonald at Old Colony, speaking of someone who's gracious and kind, and I said, I'm going to be in a room with a bunch of talented genealogists who are also interested in King Philip's War. Those subjects have to be the sweet spot of the Old Colony Historical Society. What can we do for them? And she said, well, how about this? If you're not already a member, we can offer them free one-year family memberships. And if they are members, we can offer them a $10 discount on anything in our gift shop. The only catch is you've got to be at the museum before the end of August. Got some books to sell and sign for $15. And on that note, I am happy to take comments or questions. Um, my question is, you've given us a lot of resources. What is the very first documented history of this war? closest to the time of the war. Who writes the first? Who writes the first? I think you'd have to pick Increase Mather's book, History of the War. The, the first book I showed you of the four, mm -hmm. that came out first. And what year was that? It was it was right at right at the end of the war, so it was either 1676 or 77. Okay. Okay. And your feeling about that book? Is it spot on? No. I, I would I would read Hubbard first if you want it. Contemporaneous uh, history that is closest to being accurate. They're all riddled with errors, but Hubbard's is best. Increases is first, but Hubbard's is Hubbard best. Hubbard is right behind. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. By the way, there are a number of field commanders who are writing in reports. So there are there's some writing before this, but you've got to get into the mass archives in order to see those. Uh, Leach quotes some of them. Um, are those digitized? Are those available? No. You have they at least they weren't when I went after them. You had to go sit down with Michael. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Terry? Uh, and I don't know if you're going to be able to hear me, but in reading all of this and looking at it, is, is it your feeling like this was an accidental war or this was inevitable? Like the eventually the colonists would have done this. Yeah. It was just this just, just one spot. Yeah, it's a hard it, you know, if I were, if I had a PhD in history, I would refuse to answer that. <laughs> but I don't, so I, I think it was inevitable. Okay. I think it was inevitable. And the, the English were, I mean, it took only a few years in Plymouth before they wanted to settle Duxbury. I mean, they were just bursting out. Yeah. Roger Williams says land is their great god. And then the last one, I saw that letter that you had that someone said unrelated to King Philip. I mean, there's DNA testing right now. And that genealogy of that um, the, descent, the the woman that sued and got the land there. I mean, someone must maybe someone has DNA back to King Philip. Has that been established, or it must be? So you can do it now. So there was. Um, I haven't followed up with this, but probably ten years ago there was a project put together to take DNA in the West Indian, in the Caribbean, okay, and try to match it. But it got a lot of push. Okay. Well, I don't know where it ended up, okay, but it might be worth Googling. Yeah, I, sure. I will do that now as well because I'm interested. Yeah, there's a small area in Bermuda too that claims the descendants of That's right. That's correct. Yep. Okay, any other questions? One more. One more question. <laughs> okay.
Hodison. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned on... Uh, what was the name? Hodison. It's a Todison or Todison? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We don't really know. So the people at home, yeah. All right. On page 115, you have him listed as being a sachem of the Mattapoisett and one of Philip's principal lieutenants during the war. Right. Where was Mattapoisett? So I mean, I mean the current Mattapoisett. The current. The current. Okay, that can That's throw you. Because there's a, there's there was a the Mattapoisett Correct. village, which is where Somerset is now. Correct. All right. Yep. So you're thinking that that's, is there any kind of um, source that tells him that that was uh, at that time, uh, in 1675, <laughs> that he was from the Mattapoisett or you know, Sipican I, area? I don't remember, a, it would be in the book if there's a source, it would be sourced in the book, but I remember walking out to the area around the landfill with one of the local historians, which is the area that, that the camp was, his camp, one of his camps was supposed yeah. to be. Now that's the camp, yeah. but the village, see, that's the thing. Know. So it's a little confusing there on... Are you an editor in real life? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a family genealogist, uh -huh. and I'm a student of history as it relates to my family and Dartmouth, uh -huh. okay, and the old Dartmouth. Beyond that, it's just little pieces of information. So, so when are we going to read your book? <laughs> I'm not a reader. You'll have to sit down and talk to me about all the, the big parts and the not so good parts. <laughs> so, yeah. There is your favorite thing, a rock. There is a rock, Totus and Rock, in, in, uh, I do this in Rochester. In Rochester? Right in yep. the my aunt's house. Yep. Right in there. That would be the same yeah. yeah, and one of one of our members is sending him to find another rock. <laughs> <laughs> Abrams Rock, if some of you have visited. Yes. Uh, right in Swansea. Visit that with me. Yeah. There's a story there. I don't like the story, so I don't really repeat it. <laughs> but it is a famous rock. Are we all set? I would like to thank everyone for coming, and that's both people online and people here in the room.